we finally reached our cabin in Wyoming with the trailer load of supplies for fixing the cabin up. We noticed the antelope have been licking their salt block and have nearly licked it all away. There's only a little bit left, but that doesn't matter. They're still coming. Out by the salt lick, we noticed some dung beetles rolling a little ball of antelope dung over to their den where they'll make good use of it. Some little flocks are blooming. In this high altitude at 7,600 feet, there's not a whole lot of flowers, although a fair amount but their little propellers of flowers cheer you up. Old Gimpy, the old antelope buck that lives around here, is still with us. I thought he might not have survived the winter with his bad leg, but it seems like he's definitely a tough old guy and a survivor. We've noticed him for about 10 years, and the only difference we can see is his limp might be getting a little bit worse did it better but he's still polishing those old horns up and getting ready for the rut he's in hopes of getting him a nice harem of does well we get our stuff in loaded and we decide it's time to head for the four corners area we're going to go take in some of the ancient Indian sites down in the Four Corners area. We move down our little road and head straight for Utah. We'll go all the way through Utah till we come to Mesa Verde. First site we see is Names Hill. A hawk catches a thermal over the hill and then we see the hill. This was a crossing of the Green River by the early fur track first and pine. Our first stop will be at a sandstone bluff right alongside the Green River where the fur trappers and pioneers crossed the Green River on their way west. It's called Names Hill and they carved messages and their names into the sandstone of the hill. There's even a entry on it called Jim Gridger Trapper, 1844 Trapper. This was a very interesting sight. There's numerous names in the rocks. We only spend a short while and then we're underway again and past an old sheep wagon where there's a sheep herder with a dog and a horse. Then we move through Salt Lake City, Utah. And as we go into Salt Lake, there's a rest stop where we stopped and gathered a little bit of tourist information. There are more things to see there then we're going to have time to see them. But we're going to get a bunch of material and then we can go through it and see what we want. When it came time to camp that night, we pulled off in a patch of sagebrush alongside the highway and there's a little squall hanging on the horizon. But it worked fairly well for a place to camp the only thing I think I would have camped a little farther from the highway next time because we did hear some highway noise. But the next morning we wake up refreshed and we're ready to get the day started. We find the sago lily. This is Utah's state flower blooming right in some of the cracked earth in the desert. On the desert floor, we see the evening primrose proudly spreading its petals of blossom out over the desert. Near where we camped, the desert floor was decorated with a variety of different wild flowers, all 
a little bit different and all very, very pretty. But we don't have a lot of time to waste. There's some clouds hanging on the horizon and we've got to get on the highway and get... At first, the scenery didn't seem much different than it did other places on the way down. But now we're getting close to canyon lands and hey, we're here. And we're seeing a lot more sandstone and a little difference in the wild flowers. And at the higher elevations, we see some huge juniper trees and all sorts of sculptured cliffs and uh, different types of flowers in bloom when we get this far down. And Marge is having a heyday getting pictures of even the tiniest little flowers that are sticking their heads above the desert floor. The prickly pear cactus are starting to bloom down here already. The cliffs are sculptured almost like a prize winning sculpture has done this, but it's all from nature. The wild flowers are starting to bloom real well. The sunflowers that we see here are blooming really well. They were an important plant for the Native Americans. They used the seed from them. The global mullen are blooming their heads off right in front of us on the floor. of The flowers of every shape and every color are starting to bloom and it's look they're looking very nice this year. They must have had enough moisture to make it happen. They're just every shape, every color, every kind of flowers from the very dainty ones to the larger. Uh, this is the Chola cactus blossom and the prickly pear and more of the sunflowers gently waving in the br gentle canyon breeze. Some more cactus blooming and then the dock is blooming too. They don't have a real pretty bloom but they're part of it. And these were an important plant for the Native Americans. They could grind. We move on from the sandy areas of the top of the canyon over to where we can overlook into the canyon itself. The views at first weren't that special of the canyon until we get down a little farther and then it's awe-inspiring as we drop down on, on a little uh, graded road that drives you down into the canyon. You can get clear th go clear through this canyon on a dirt road, although we didn't go that far, but it was really nice. The yucca have found their own special little niche to grow right on a ledge overlooking the canyon with some really neat cliffs down. We were awestruck by the immensity of the cliffs and the canyon down below as we sat and watched the yucca wave gently in a gentle canyon breeze. We only have two-wheel drive in our pickup so we elected not to go any farther down. If we ran out of power, we'd be in trouble. But those people on the bicycle don't seem to be worrying about it. I guess they've got plenty of power.
were hoping to have enough power to get out of the canyon. We just have a small four-cylinder motor in this pickup and just a standard transmission. So we have to sort of get a run at some of the steeper places or we'll run out of power and not be, not be able to make it out of the canyon. That wouldn't be a very good we were right on the edge of our power as we climbed out of the canyon. We just get a run on the flatter places and get enough momentum to get up the steeper part. But if we'd have gone clear down in the bottom, it might have been a different story. Our clutch might have get hot, might have gotten hot and started smelling. And I don't want to burn a clutch out in a place like this. So we hurry out of the canyon as best we can. And then we'll drive around up on the flat part of the ridge above where we can overlook the little road that we could have gone out on, I guess, down below us. We weren't one bit disappointed with it, though, because when we got up on the rim, we can see some amazing scenery out beyond us, and we weren't even one little bit disappointed with it. There's uh, the flat ridge up above was very easy for us. To... The prince's plume gently waves in the morning breeze as we take to the vehicle and head back to try another spot and see what new things we can find. Lots of juniper and, as always, some beautiful scenery as there are cliffs in the background. And when we get up on top in the sand, there are many cactus in bloom. And Marge is going to take a lot and lots of pictures of the cactus this is a prickly pear cactus mostly. And then on top of some of the hills, we see some cliffs majestically standing up, reaching skyward. The Green River is responsible for this artwork down below us. As we look down and we can see the Green River winding its way through the canyon that it's carved as it goes down and joins up with the Colorado River just a short distance down below. We're up right on top of the ridge and the juniper are growing in in some very nice formations. And we can look down and see the sculpture of the Green River down below us. So far this is the second state in which we followed along the Green River. And this is where the most spectacular scenery is of the Green River. As we left it up, we started up in Wyoming and went clear down to the point where we are now. But we've worked up an appetite, so Marge is going to cook us something to eat. We have carefully looked the place over as we move as we move south so far, and so now we're going to try to make Arches National Park, where we still have some light to see some things as we go down through a, a little canyon that's carefully sculptured out by Mother Nature, winding through sandstone carved washes and canyons were heading straight for Arches National Park. We have read some tourist stuff on it and it sounds like that's the place we need to be. There are so many delicate, delicately balanced rocks as we move down toward arches that we're almost becoming used to them. 
Then we break out into a larger valley and look ahead, and here it is. Finally, after all these years, we're making it to Arches National Park. We go through the little pay station behind a lot of tourists from other places. At this time of year when we were there, the biggest share of the tourists were from Europe because the American schools hadn't let out yet. So that's great. We're going to get to see Arches National Park. We look at their entry fee, but we have a card, a, an old timer's card that lets us in for free. And a nice little park ranger girl checks us in, and finally we're in Arches Park. Now the first thing we want to see, and we want to see it all too, so we're going to follow some of the directions we have on our tourist information and the scenery is getting better and better and so we'll find us a place to park right where there's a really nice view of things and then we'll take to foot and go up the trail. As we walk down the trail we look up ahead of us and we're dwarfed by the immensity of some of these pillars and spirals reaching skyward. We just hope there isn't an earthquake and they don't come tumbling down. Since our time is limited, we're trying to make the very best out of this trip that we possibly can. So we want to see every single rock and every single formation that we possibly can as we move further and further down into Arches National Park. We can't help ourselves but to stop and look at some of the balanced rocks very delicately balanced up there. I don't think I'd want to go sit down under that one, particularly if there was an earthquake going to happen. But this place was once inhabited with European settlers. Leg injury from the city of John to move to Ohio looking for a dry climate. He chose this tract of 100 acres along Salt Wash for its water and grassland, enough for a few cattle. The Wolfs built a one-room cabin, a corral, and a small dam across Salt Wash. For more than a decade, they lived alone on the remote ranch. In 1906, John's daughter, Flora Stanley, her husband, and their children moved to the ranch. Shocked at the primitive conditions, Flora convinced her father to build a new cabin with a wood floor. The cabin you see. The The cabins and corral fences don't look a whole lot different than a ranching area or a homestead in other places up north like Montana or Wyoming, although the surrounding area is considerably different. There's still an old buckboard wagon sitting there. I'll bet that was a rough thing if you had some high-spirited horses on it. And we can actually go look in the cabin and see what's in there. There's very little left in the cabin, but wow, what a cozy, nice little place to live. With a dirt roof and some a water source out front. Where there's a water source, we look for petroglyphs. And here's an e excellent example 
of petroglyphs on the rocks, even warriors riding horses. So that sort of dates it as to when this spot was inhabited. It was during historical times and lots of bighorn sheep. Most every petroglyph that I've ever been to in the West has bighorn sheep on it. After thirdly examining the rock art, we move on. There's a stiff breeze starting to blow, and Marge is having to hold her hat on. Some little flowers must have been hard up for a place to grow. They're hanging out of a little cliff. And we move on across the sandstones. We're heading for Delicate Arch. And Delicate Arch is the one that the picture is on, the, its picture is on the Utah license plate. We move up the ridge and see a bunch of people sitting around. And we get up there and wow, what a sight. And that's Delicate Arch, the one pictured on Utah license plates. And we can even see a few snow-capped mountains in the background as Marge holds her hat down and poses for a picture. We can probably thank the little stream running down below it for carving out this wonderful piece of artwork right out in the top on the top of a hill in a sandstone bluff and wow what a place and you can even go stand in the arch although the arch is so big that marge is almost completely dwarf standing in under the arch it was a ways to hike up here but it was worth every second that it took and every step to get here. And I'd do it again in a heartbeat. There's not every place in the world you can see an arch like this. And so now it's time for us to take the trail and head back down to our vehicle. As we start moving down in the canyon, the view becomes better and better all the time with more cliffs and higher cliffs and a deeper canyon unfolding down below us. It's getting to where if you're scared of heights, this might bother you a little bit, but it's one excellent view. Past numerous European tourists as they want to get their own look at Delicate Arch and some rock cairns mark the trail down across some of the sandstone in sort of a wash as we move back down through some ancient juniper trees that have grown huge here and part of them have, there's some dead stuff on part of them but they're very very pretty as we move one foot in front of the other down toward our vehicle. We move past the old trees in the wash and we're not done with arches yet. There are arches nearly every place you look here. I guess when they named this Arches National Park that they weren't kidding around because that's exactly what it is. Just numerous arches every place. Makes you think about the old homesteaders and the Indians too that lived in this valley down below us. I certainly hope they appreciated the scenery of the area as much as we appreciate it just visiting. But imagine what it would be if you woke up every day to scenery like this. All kinds of little windows in the mountains, little caves, and arches all over the place.